kids are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs> Yes, hello, hello, whoops, uh, hold on a sec, <laughs> uh, let me just go and, uh, put it back to, there we go, there we go, we, now we have the, uh, the title over here, alright folks, so sorry for that little technical difficulty, just needed to redo the intro, but yes, welcome back to Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, and, uh, once again, I've already, uh, done my intro, but I'll do it a little bit again. Uh, I have with me a special guest star in which, uh, you may know as a Toon Rific Tariq, uh, the man that, if, if you probably know his most popular video, he is the man that, uh, analyzed the, um, black animated characters from uh, Cleveland Brown to the Proud Family to Craig Williams, along with making plenty of other fascinating uh, animation reviews. So, uh, dude, what's up? And again, so sorry about that little accident there. At school, man, we can't really control this. <laughs> it's all, it's all, at, a, at a certain degree, it's all out of our hands at this point. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so now we got everything set up. Now we have everything good. It is now time we can go and start this out. So, I'll ask once again, Tariq, are you ready for today's episode? Yes. Yes, uh, I am. <laughs> all right. And now that the chat wall can hear you as well, folks, are you ready for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it. Yes. All right. Good. Everyone's ready, everyone's prepared, the delay is done, so now we can go and get things started. And with our first story, we're going to go back to uh, an older news that I have discussed a few weeks ago, and that is regarding the situation with Studio Ghibli. Now, you might recall that at Studio Ghibli, even if there is a pandemic right now, they are actually doing pretty well for themselves. They are still working on their animated projects. Uh, they are still working on the highly anticipated How Do You Live movie, which is going to be done by Hayao Miyazaki, even though the process is going to be very slow because right now they're at only uh, one minute of animation per month now. So we still have to wait a few more years on that. Man. But... There is also another project that they have revealed, and they were very secretive about it, and that is their first computer animated feature, which is going to be directed by Goro Miyazaki. And shockingly enough, uh, they actually revealed pretty, click, uh, pretty quickly about what it is. And what, it, and what they have revealed is going to be... Oops, nope, it's not this one. Hold on, that's my little Discord thing with Tariq. It's... <laughs> uh, Aya Tomajo, or as it's known in English, Aya and the Witch. Studio Ghibli has recently announced that the next animated feature that they are going to be releasing pretty soon is going to be a computer animated film adaptation of the Diana Wynne Jones children's novel Earwig and the Witch, in which they changed the title to Aya and the Witch. Uh, once again, it is going to be directed by Goro Miyazaki, and it will be Studio Ghibli's first ever computer animated feature. By the way, thank you, Yami119, for the subscription. And uh, to, if, if you want to know a little bit more about what the story would be about, it states here from my source on Variety, Earwig is living in an orphanage and quite enjoying it when she is adopted by a witch and taken to her spooky house. But instead of being terrified, the clever Earwig is determined to become the master of her new situation. Now, one interesting fact that I would like to go and point out regarding uh, this novel in particular, Earwig and the Witch, and specifically with Diana Wynne-Jones, is that this is not the first time that Studio Ghibli actually adapted one of her books. Uh, she is also the original author of Howl's Moving Castle, in which uh, Hayao Miyazaki has already turned it into a movie uh, in the mid-2000s. Now, it has stated that it will not be released in theaters, but instead, it is actually going to be premiering 
on um, the TV channel NHK in Japan at the end of 2020, where it says in winter 2020, that's when it's going to show on NHK. But at the same time, though, this week, they have also revealed that it will also be making its premiere at the Cannes Film Festival, along with three other animated features, which includes Flea, Joseph, and Pixar Soul. So, uh, Tariq, I would like to know about your thoughts about uh, the upcoming, uh, Hayo, uh, not Hayao Miyazaki, but the upcoming Studio Ghibli movie. What are your thoughts on this so far? I think the thing that fascinated me most about it was that, like, reading this, it just said that it was going to be in CG. Like, that's one thing that like, just kind of say that. That's such like a, like a broad kind of scope of just like where they could take like the look of it. You know what I mean? And like, and they capture the essence of like heavy hand drawn. Yeah. Like nature of like the Ghibli films or whatever. Like there's such like a big oh, and there's a style to it, you know? like wondering what that would look like is like that's the part about it than me yeah that is true but then again i i do trust them a little bit because they have experimented a little with uh with uh, with computer animation before there was a computer animated short that they did exclusively for the ghibli museum that is done by uh, hayao miyazaki called boro the caterpillar but um again that's just exclusively to uh uh, well, it's exclusive to uh, to the Ghibli Museum, but a more public example, like if you want to see one that actually knows what it could look like, then there is uh, an animated series that is done by Goro Miyazaki uh, that's called uh, Ronya the Robber's Daughter. Uh, have you have you seen any stuff from that, or have you? Heard uh, of it? Uh, I, I I'm sorry, like I I can't, like we we were in the middle of talking. What was that? Uh, no, I was saying no, I, I haven't. Oh, you haven't? No, it's mm -hmm. it actually does look pretty nice, and um, you look at it, and it does stay true to the style of um, uh, of uh, the of the classic Ghibli look. And um, I, I guess another example that we could point out, in a way, there is a, a video game series, be, like it, it just recently turned into a video game series, uh, one called Nino Kuni in which it does have uh, Studio Ghibli helping out, especially with the art style, that does use a bit of uh, 3D graphics as well. So, you know, like, we've already seen some prominent examples here. In fact, maybe I could go and uh, find you some. Like, I'll, I'll even show you a, a little clip of... Uh, yeah, I, I, like, type in... Uh, I typed in uh, Onya just to see, like, like shots of what it looks like. And, like, it's really... Like, I see, like, they have, like, the cell shaded thing going on here like oh yeah i, I i'm expecting like considering that she it is she was... be quiet you <laughs> so quiet trailer okay but like what i'm expecting considering that it is um goro miyazaki that's going to be working on it that we're going to see pretty much no not that sorry uh we're, we're pretty much going to go and see the same thing as this that we're going to see a lot of like cell shaded animation like really trying to recreate that Studio Ghibli look, and um, that that the, like uh, knowing Studio Ghibli, like they want to stay the same thing. That like they want to stay and stick to their uh, art style as much as possible. So I think what we what we see with Ronya could be the same thing with uh, with uh, Aya and the Witch. And I then. That, I think that'd just be like something cool to really look at. Like I think it like, especially like on like the scale of like a feature, oh right, yeah. and everything like, like. I think that'd just be like really cool to see. Um, it sucks that like, you know, like a lot, a lot of these films get kind of nowadays they gotta get like on like television or some kind of service in order to see them now, just because we can't go to the movies. This would this would have been like really cool to see like. Yeah, that is true. That, that is true. Like, get a special G Kids presentation on the big screen. That would have been very nice. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and especially um, considering it's going to be, like, 
like the fact that it, it will feature a witch inside a spooky house um it'll be fascinating to see uh like the magical elements uh be brought back to life because that is something that we've had we haven't had in a very very long time from uh, studio ghibli let alone uh just a feature film and and especially what i find to be nice is that it will give a second chance for goro miyazaki to try out a more magical story per se because his directorial debut was tales from Earthsea, and that yeah. movie was like in my opinion it's just okay but i do agree with many that it is the weakest uh, Studio Ghibli film out there that it doesn't have that same punch or the same magic as uh, the as like his dad or like some of the other films out there. But at least now we do have like a second chance, and he definitely has improved himself very well with uh, from up on Poppy Hill. So hopefully with this one we will see a significant improvement that um, that we'll see some of that old Studio Ghibli magic come to life, but now in CG. Yeah, I remember like reading about that. Like I never saw um Retro debut. I never saw that film, but like I remember reading about just like people and like it was like way it was like a couple tiers under like everything else they were doing. And then when I found out it was his first one, I don't I'm not sure. Was it the first Ghibli film that wasn't directed by uh Hayao Miyazaki or was that like um, well, you got to keep in mind, there's also Iseo Takahata. So that in terms of that answer is no, but, um, there have been other directors other than those two. Of course there was, um, well, the name escapes me. Unfortunately, the one who directed uh, whisper of the heart, like he, he had prominent, like he showed a lot of promise to be like the next great studio Ghibli director. But then unfortunately, uh, he died not long, uh, around the release of, uh, whisper of the heart so that was very unfortunate mm. and then there is um uh oh then there oh then there's also the cat returns that's also another unique one as well like probably yeah. uh, funny enough the only one that goes beyond the uh to the usual studio ghibli film uh the studio stu uh, the typical studio ghibli look i don't know why that was hard for me to say <laughs> uh hiroma yeah hiromasa yonebayashi that that's the uh, director of uh, Whisper of the Heart. Okay. So Whisper of the Heart a long time ago. I really love it. It's like it's such a great movie. Oh yeah, no, that was that was surprisingly great actually. It's very unfortunate the guy passed away, but no, the, like yeah. Studio Ghibli did have uh, did have a bit of experience with other directors other than uh, uh, Takahata and Miyazaki, so. Uh, and especially nowadays, like we, we got to have like a new generation of directors. So um, there, Maybe. there is that. Oh no, Hiromasa Yonebayashi is the other one. Oh crap! Sorry. No, no, no. Okay, sorry, but um, no, Hiromasa Yonebayashi is the one who did uh, when Marnie was there and uh, and uh, the Secret World of Arietti. Sorry. Oh uh, okay, I saw, I saw that one in theater. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, have you? Yeah, do you, have you seen uh, some Studio Ghibli films in theaters? Like other than, um, like probably the Ghibli, like the ones that are put up by G Kids. But uh... I've only seen I've seen I've only seen um, Arietti. I remember when that when Disney, um, that whole thing where they released it and they had like the girl from Good Luck Charlie in it and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like I remember I remember that and I remember seeing that in a the theater and I remember like. That was one of the first times, like, like got out of a movie and like, it's like you. It makes you realize like how boring your life is around you, like, because the movie like puts you in like this world that's like so dope, and like you gotta go out, you gotta go back outside and like a normal human being. Like that was the first time I ever like experienced that before. Yeah, and by the way, just on a quick side note, it's Yoshi, it, it's Yoshi Fumi Kondo that I was thinking about in terms of the director of Whisper of the Heart. Okay, now we've okay. got all that settled. But yeah, I mean that that's kind of the power of Studio Ghibli films is that um, a lot of them really does make you appreciate nature more. That it mm -hmm. makes you aware about like the environment that is around you that's not man-made. Like, it, it, it's kind of like a signature trait of uh, Studio Ghibli. Definitely. All the ones that I've seen, definitely, they've all given me, like, the exact same feeling. 
of the heart to Kiki's delivery service. I was moving castles. It is always just this like, uh, just like love for the open space and everything around you and like all of that makes you feel and like get to take all of that in. The characters are like allowed to breathe. Just something that like, it, it, especially like now you kind of miss that when like characters are allowed to like step back and like think about everything that's going on around them and like don't have to do or need to do do anything like all the time they don't have to constantly be like cracking a joke or you know like jumping around or something like that there's like really like calming nature to the simplicity to a lot of those true that's yeah and especially that's why everybody loves the uh the train scene from spirited away where um where you see chihiro and no face like all they're doing is literally just sitting on the train and that's it and yet it's a mm. pretty powerful scene in itself yeah definitely yeah and uh funny enough though um like going back to talking about uh the movie that is going to be coming up i am the witch uh, I, I will say right now, I'm not really familiar with the um, with the novel itself, but um, I, honestly, like hearing about the story, I don't know if this is going to be the kind that will actually feature that, though. I think this is going to be one that will take a different step. In fact, actually, considering that it is from the author of uh, Howl's Moving Castle, we would probably expect a little bit something similar to that. It's like we should expect something more like Howl's Moving Castle that will emphasize more on the magic more so than probably the environment. Mm. But still, I, I, I will say, I am uh, very intrigued to see what it is. And I mean, like, uh, I'm, I'm honestly surprised that we're going to get it much sooner than I thought. Like, I, I thought this would be something that they would release after Hayao Miyazaki's movie. But no, like, they're going to get it soon. But... Like, even though, like, yeah, it's going to be at the end of 2020, technically, that they're going to premiere it in Japan. And there is, like, the Cannes Film Festival, but that's the Cannes Film Festival, so right. that's pretty hard to try to get that. So probably sometime in, tw like, if I would have to take a guess, it is possible that sometime in 2021, um, it will be released in other parts of the world that we will have, like, different dubs of it. And could actually make its premiere on the big screen. So if, if there is one thing to look on the bright side of, we know that um, like if there is going to be, uh, if this movie will actually be released in North America, then we know that um, th there is a chance that uh, we will see characters be released. Like w we, we will see this movie be released on the big screen. Like there is a strong chance, I'd say. I'm hoping, I'm hoping for it. I'm always, I'm always up to see like a beautiful film on the screen. There's nothing like seeing a beautiful animated film like in in like a theater. You know what I mean? Like that's like the best one to have. Oh yeah, like on the big screen, so that you can soak in every detail that you see. Up yeah. There. Oh, I I know that feeling. I I kind of miss that feeling, honestly. But yeah, I like. I was thinking the other day. I got all of these uh. Um, ticket stubs hanging on my wall and I think the last time I went to the movies was like onward that's the last uh movie I've seen in theaters since like all this happened and, uh, um, same here same here actually I don't know if I've already told the story in uh in the podcast but um the last time that I I went to the theaters to watch onward it was actually a very unique experience because I went in like the full-on upgraded cinema and really got like a very unique experience because not only did i go on like a special imax screening of it but i also went into one of those d box chairs that move with the movie at the same time and oh, it man. was it was a freaky <laughs> experience and you know how like it, it could be pretty intense it could be it could be pretty action-packed so there are times like i'm just watching the movie and like it freaks me out like not just what's happening on screen but also with the chair it's like i don't want to join this adventure what's going on yeah no i don't i don't know if i could have dealt with that like onward was like one of the uh one of the first times i had like like an anxiety attack in the theater like when he's like walking across the uh bridge but like the bridge isn't there really and he has like the rope and oh, rope yes. like comes oh my god like i was like like i was like 
shrieking in a movie theater. <laughs> like me and my friends were like yelling. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know if I could have dealt with that if like my chair was moving too. I probably would have fainted. Oh god, yeah, you probably would. Oh my god. But anyways, um, I would like to go into the chat wall, and now I want to ask you all, what do you think about uh, the newly announced Aya and the Witch? Are you guys excited for this one? Do you have any concerns? Let me know what you all think about this uh, new uh, Ghibli movie coming up at the end of the year. Uh, let's see. Uh, a question I do have for this movie is how faithful it will be to the original book, since if you didn't know, the Howl's Moving Castle movie is so different compared to the book that it could be considered its own thing. That is a good question, and it, it, it did actually state in this article on Variety, if I may go and uh, look here. Yeah, it says that in the Ghibli version, her name has been changed to Aya, where they can't just call her Earwig. Uh, but the studio has not revealed the extent of other story revisions. So you could bring up a good point that they could take a lot of liberties. And um, if the title is any indication, then maybe they will do a good amount. But I guess that's Studio Ghibli's say on this, and that's Goro Miyazaki's say on this. So that's honestly something that we will have to wait and see. Uh, let's see now. Uh, I'm honestly really intrigued of this feature. The plot line sounds really cool. I like the idea of the classic Ghibli style in CG, and I really hope Goro can show his true potential. I'll likely check it out, but I just hope it doesn't go into the up on Poppy Hill route and suddenly become a mystery about incest. Yeah, that- huh? that, Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a thing, all right. It's like, it started out as a bit of a love story, and then like, through some discovery, it was like, oh, wait a minute. I thought we were a couple. No, we're, you're, we're actually brother and sister. It's one oh, of those God. scenarios. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, no, that's not... But it's still a it's still a really nice movie. It's still worth checking out, though. I still highly recommend it. Uh, let's see now. Oh, uh, someone has a true story. True story. Before they announced on what Goro's next movie was going to be, I had a dumb prediction that the next Goro movie might be a film adaptation of a Final Fantasy game, but this movie is something I might enjoy and be excited about. Oh, we would hear so much more if that was the case. Like, imagine if they if Studio Ghibli announced that they were going to do a Final Fantasy film. That would be something that the internet would flip out about. Especially yeah, no, that would be all over. <laughs> Yeah, especially that not long ago we just had the release of the remake of Final Fantasy VII. Like, if Studio Ghibli revealed they're going to do a Final Fantasy movie, that's going to be the only thing the internet would talk about. That's going to be the only thing people will speculate, people will yeah. discuss. It would just be, it would be more insane than it would be right now. Yeah, for sure. Like, just like, just like, oh, we're gonna do this uh, CG movie based on this book. It's like, yeah, a couple people are talking about it, but like, no, we're gonna do like a Final Fantasy movie. Like, yeah, no, that's like, put a hole in like every news outlet. Oh yeah. I, oh god. It would. I don't think the world would be ready for uh, a Studio Ghibli Final Fantasy film. Uh, let's see now. I'm honestly really intrigued of this pe of this feature. The plot. The plot line sounds really cool. I like the idea of the classic Ghibli style in CG. And I really hope Goro can show... Oh, wait a minute. No, wait. No, I already read that one. Sorry. Um, let's see. Haven't read the book, but judging by its depiction, Earwig and the Witch is like a combo of Roald Dahl's BFG and the Witches. Uh, I have not seen any of the Ghibli films, but aside from Howl's Moving Castle, it's quite rare that a Japanese animation studio would adapt something from Britain. Most of the time, Japan likes to take influence from America. That is true. And, and I would say, honestly, that would actually be a great potential idea that if Studio Ghibli would adapt a Roald Dahl story, that would be very fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, I wasn't really too into like his, his books when I was younger, but I did know of a few of them. And I could just imagine like what would go what would like what would everything like look like and how would they execute that yeah tr yeah, yeah yeah i mean like it, it really does depend i mean like fantastic mr fox has already been covered and a few others but like an animated adaptation of something like uh well like a like a more 
bigger version of the BFG or oh my god, Studio Ghibli's Willy Wonka. That would be something. Yeah. Like did uh I know there's a movie about uh is the book called Witches, I think. That's what the book's called. The yeah, World yeah, yeah. Book. The Witches. Yeah, and I, I remember like that's uh, that's one that I would like read a little bit of in like school um when I was a kid and I was like, why isn't there a movie about this? And I found out that there was and I never went to go go see it, but it wasn't animated for sure. And like the whole yeah. time I was reading it, I was just seeing it as an animated but have you have you seen the movie though? Like honestly, it's pretty messed up. Yeah, <laughs> the book is messed up, so I, I can only imagine. I haven't seen. It oh, let's just say the movie is faithful, and it 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 loves practical effects. I'll just leave That's it at the that. Best. That's the best. It's the best. Watch the witches today. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be that'll be something you could do for after this podcast. Just check out the witches, see for yourself, and um, just enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to do that. Oh, and one more thing I want to add about the witches is that if you think the movie is crazy, wait till you hear about the behind the scenes stuff. It's even oh, more no. insane. Yeah, it's one of those production stories. Oh no! I don't know, like. It's like the behind the scenes of like a lot of movies, especially ones that are like supposed to be greatest films of all time. It's like it's really don't like all that stuff with uh like Stanley Kubrick and like uh Shining. I just think that's the one that I'm thinking of. Like Oh yeah. Yeah, it's like oh my god, and this is like <laughs> one of the most celebrated movies ever made, and like it was like impossible to make and like um Apocalypse Lips now is like notorious for being like the worst film set like of all time. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely, and especially like nowadays, how many versions do we have of that film? Oh, no idea. It's, it's it's a it's a. I guess it's a good thing that it was like successful that all like in like everybody didn't just kind of go through all of that for nothing, but. Uh, I was just like reading like the stories and like hearing everything about like what happened to true status. Like, I want to make movies, but do I really want to. Like, is this is this really? <laughs> does it come down to this? This kind of stuff. I, I want to make movies, but do I want to go through this? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. to be another way. Yeah, it's years of trials and tribulations sometimes. But anyways, it is now time we will jump on to the next story that we have. And this is actually, uh, coincidentally, a bit of a smooth transition because this is another one that surprisingly has a lot of troubles. And you didn't, you wouldn't think that this is something that would end up being controversial, but it ended up getting so serious to the point that they had to take it up in court. But luckily, there is a finale. There is a conclusion to this. And I'm talking about what's happening with Watership Down. The Watership Down Enterprises, which is the estate of Richard Adams, has recently won a court case against the creator, which is the producer, writer, and director of the 1978 animated film based on the novel Martin Rosen. Now, essentially what happened is that Rosen has uh, not only infringed copyright, but he has also agreed on unauthorized license deals and denying royalty payments. Uh, pretty much the big thing is that uh, he was pretty much acting like he owns all the rights, when in truth, he only has the movie rights. And now because of the court case, uh, they have demanded Martin Rosen to pay $95,000 to Watership Down Enterprises. And on top of that, no surprise that he also completely lost uh, his uh, film rights and is not allowed to use any of the rights to Watership Down for any future projects. And uh, apparently this guy really made a lot of shady deals that ended up becoming big and prominent projects as well. Um, apparently he made uh, $85,000 alone from an unauthorized license for an audiobook. And also, he did not pay any of the, uh, the fees or pay anything to the estate for the 2018 TV adaptation of the film from BBC and Netflix. 
uh, if I may go and take a quote from uh, Julie Johnson, who uh, Juliet Johnson, who is the daughter of Richard Ad of Richard Adams and the manager direct uh, the managing director of Watership Down Enterprises, she stated. As custodian of this most beloved novel, our family has an obligation to protect the publishing and other rights for Watership Down, and to preserve the essence of our father's creation. After many years trying to resolve matters directly with Martin Rosen, we are extremely pleased with the High Court's ruling. We can now look forward to the future and develop new projects that honor the powerful and pertinent messages of Watership Down about the environment, leadership, and friendship. So yeah, this is another uh, production trouble that has happened for literally decades. Uh, just want to know, uh, Tariq, do you have any thoughts on this? I think like the the thing that's like tripping me out about it is like Watership Down is from like 1978. Like this is like like you said, it's been going on for like a while, and I like had no idea um, about any of this. Like even thinking about just like how um, it's work in terms of like adapt like um you see this kind of thing happen a lot with like um like anime shows or something like that like with um Aaron Magruder and like the boondock and how like I don't think he can make the comic anymore because so the rights to um Viacom well not Viacom but uh no, turning like adult and stuff yeah. yeah I don't uh, and I don't even think I don't think they produce it. I think Sony produces the Boondocks animated series. Like this is just like there's a lot of different like hands in the pot and names that you normally associate with these things probably don't even have any jurisdiction over them anymore. And like this is like a case of that. Like, like I didn't even like even imagine just like how this would be like going through this literal decades like a lot can happen within that time span but like the fact that you've just now gotten to the point where like a case is won and everything like that is like is weird mm -hmm. no but um but but to expand on what you are talking about uh, like at the very least if if i can be a little bit of devil's advocate um, like with Cartoon Network and with Sony, with the whole situation of the boondocks, technically, like what they have done, they're still on their legal grounds because they ended up fully yeah. owning the rights to the boondocks. Where this, on the other hand, with Martin Rosen, he only had the film rights, but acted like he had all of the rights. Yeah, like, to man, act like th Yeah, that's the part where it really is messed up in this situation because... Like, he pretty much acted like the barrier because he stated, like, oh, I'm the guy who made the animated film and I have all the rights. And that's what people know Watership Down the most. Because let's be honest, um, if you think about Watership Down, people will first think about the animated film more so than the actual novel. And this is unfortunately a situation where often... Uh, it, like when it comes to film adaptation, some people can really get it, it get in get it in their heads that somehow they feel like they are the creator because it is sadly true that most people know more about the film adaptation more so than the actual book. Like here's a great example. Um, if I would tell you who Martin, uh, Martin C, uh, no, not Martin. Sorry. If, if I asked you who is Robert C. O'Brien, would you know what I'm talking about? No. Uh. Okay. Um, if I would ask you who created the Rats of Nim, who would you say? Oh yeah, I would probably say Tom Bluth. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. That 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 that's the situation that I'm talking about because a lot of people think like with. Um, with, with stuff that are based on no, with stuff that were based on novels, people will immediately think more about the movies more so than the books. And there are plenty of other examples as well. I don't think anybody can name me who who is the original author of uh, the Rescuers, but we all know that it is a Disney movie. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and, and several examples as well. And this is an unfortunate situation where, again, with Martin Rosen, it really got into his head, and it's kind of shocking that. Over the years, 
like the amount of stuff that he got away with especially like mm -hmm. with some very prominent examples especially with the um the bbc and netflix series like that was just two years ago that was highly prominent and something that had a, a like a very noteworthy all-star cast and that and yet somehow has yet to pay any of the actual fees to uh the watership down enterprises like you think it's insane how far you can get like in like yes it's just insane how far you, you can get in doing stuff and like you could still be like completely in the wrong like like you were saying it's like it was like a really high profile production and you know? a lot of like really big names attest to it and like he was able to like get away with it and do it even today yeah so like it, it honestly is a bit shocking and also a bit disappointing to see that martin rosen would be this kind of individual who tried to take advantage of his claim to fame which is the film adaptation of watership down because i've seen the movie and i really liked it like it, it is a very strong and powerful feature have you seen uh, watership down no my friends in college keep telling me how much that should because isn't it one of the only uh made the films that did it get criterion or i know fantastic yes. planet did but actually uh, uh hold on a sec nah. i actually got it right they don't, here they don't it's a lot of love but no it, no the, it, it's true like and it's actually you just brought up a great example the fact that it is released on uh criterion because technically this would like even though this is like the film the film adaptation of it like you would still have to go and pay some uh you know still pay some uh some fees for the uh for the estate and stuff like that yeah. so this yeah this is another great example of like Something that Martin Rosen might have gotten away with. It, it, it's shocking, but it's a bit disappointing, especially with something uh, that is as much of an animated classic as Watership Down, where, like, yeah, the dude made a great movie, but unfortunately, the, f the, the claim to fame of Watership Down really got to his head because he knows that he made the most popular adaptation or the most popular version of it where like he pretty much like asserted himself illegally as the guardian of watership down where people go through him first before even thinking about discussing about the watership down enterprises like and unfortunately this is even the first time for me that i've heard about watership down enterprises i didn't know that richard adams had a legitimate uh, estate yeah yeah, this, so is this kind of similar to like um something that goes on with like uh aa mill and uh the pool films is this like what is that like like is that anything oh that i i think it's more of a yeah that, i think that could be more of a complicated scenario but then again disney not actually come to think about it it's like it's not 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 necessarily i think that's more of a different thing come to think about it because like disney is mainly sticking with their brand of winnie the pooh like they're uh -huh. not saying that they own all the rights because technically there are still some uh regular aa milne stuff of winnie the pooh like uh, a great example actually not long ago there was, uh, uh, like, re recently, technically you could say there were two recent live-action films of Winnie the Pooh. Like, first you got, um, first you got Christopher Robin, which is Disney's live-action remake of Winnie the Pooh, technically. And then you also got Goodbye Christopher Robin, which was not oh, made by Disney. Oh, that did happen. Okay, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, I, I think with Disney, they kind of focus on their own take on Winnie the Pooh and really capitalize it from there. While they while the A.A. A. Milne estate, they still have their version of Winnie the Pooh. So it's not really a case where Disney is saying we own everything of Winnie the Pooh. It, it is. It does kind of come with the association to where like right? Disney knows like that they, they get to the kids first. You know what I mean? Like they know that like Tigger that the kids are quoting and that they'll remember is like theirs. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, but that's not really I agree. That's not really their fault. You know what I mean? Like that is just like they just made like popular version. Whereas like with Watership Down, it's like you know this whole thing is like and this this whole thing is built around this 
one film that I did and you know, like taking ownership of just like everything and not really looking back. Like mm-hmm. that's just, just like egregious. That's just like really that's wild. Yeah, it, it's just a very unfortunate case where the fame really got to his head and completely forgot that he only has the film rights of it. And when you have the film rights, that doesn't mean you have the rights to Watership Down. So it's just really screwing over the fam- the family enterprise. So it's trying to make it like, in a way, Martin, what Martin Rosen is doing is that he's trying to get rid of the name of Richard Adams and just put his own name. In fact, that that's actually the unfortunate thing that did happen with Watership Down because in the film itself, it actually does say that it, like the title itself is Richard Adams's Watership Down, but in the mm-hmm. in the uh, cover, it actually does state if you can see, yeah there we go, it actually states that it's Watership Down, a film by Martin Rosen. So that that's kind of like what he is doing in a way, like in a malicious kind of sense where. He's trying to associate his name to Watership Down more so than uh, Richard Adams. Dude, that's like, I don't know. I, I can't really say, like, how did you possibly think you could get away with that? Because, I mean, like, it's been happening, but, like, I, it's just weird. Like, that's, like, preserved history. You know what I mean? Like, that's just, like, something that, like, you can you can do a quick search and find out, like, oh, okay, yeah, this is or something like that you know what i mean like it's like a it's like a it's a weird thing to try to erase especially like in the time we are now when you can't really erase anything like Mm -hmm. yeah like like pretty much because of the internet history is set in stone by now and and it's an unfortunate thing to see i i still really like watership down i still love the movie but yeah this is a shocking thing to see it's 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 a bittersweet thing overall that yeah, it's bitter to see that Martin Rosen, uh, like, is a pretty bad person who let his fame get to his head to the point of thinking that he owns Watership Down. But at least there is a conclusion where justice did get served, and that like now the full rights belong to the people who should own it, and that is the Richard Adams estate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, uh, with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, what do you all think about this, uh, court case? How do you feel about the entire situation with, uh, Watership Down? I know it's a pretty crazy one, but, uh, let me, let me know what you all think. Uh, hold on a sec, just approve this one. Okay, so let's see. I read. oh. Uh, I recently saw Watership Down due to it currently being available for streaming on the Criterion channel, and I did think it was really good, and I would love to own it on Blu-ray, but the director is kind of an a-hole. At least he's not the worst person on the Criterion collection because, well, Roman Polanski exists. Also, the Boondocks troubles appear to be over since Aaron is involved with HBO Max's revival. Also, put El Dorado on Criterion collection, you cowards. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> like the the boondocks is weird because like I mean Aaron, like they lost like half, like half the, like original people that way. Aaron, even though like Aaron's name is everywhere and like people talk about him like he's like the mastermind, it's still like important puzzle pieces like Carl, like on and they're never they're never coming back. Like Carl Jones is going on. He's done like Black Dynamite. He's done like the jellies and stuff, and he's just kind of moved on or whatever. But it's kind of weird. I don't know what's gonna happen. Like with like John Witherspoon passing away, and like I don't know what's gonna happen with Granddad, and I don't know what the show's gonna be like with just Aaron there and whoever um other rest of the team is, because it's not gonna be the people that made it so great before. So I don't, I have no idea. Yeah, you do actually bring up a good point. Like, I really liked uh, the Boondocks, like the original series. Uh, but, uh, w- like, now with this revival and the fact that you did bring it up, like, I was excited before, but now that you mention it, that it is just going to be Aaron coming back and probably a new team with uh, Sony Animation to bring it out on HBO Max, 
uh, like it, it is true that like we will have to wait and see with how they are going to bring it back and if it would actually work out like worst case scenario it would end up becoming like its later seasons and that's not a direction that i i don't believe they want to go into yeah no everybody's kind of been like from like the fourth season because even just kind of looking at those episodes it's like they aren't terrible but they're relentlessly meta like they're like each it's, it's one of those things where like it's nudging you the whole time like hey remember with boondocks you gotta you remember us right like it's like kind of one of those, those things and they like the entire season is just like there's like breaking bad parodies and like good times parodies and like that's what the show was the show was like so much more before it got there and it kind of became like a watered down version of itself yeah yeah, it, it basically, like, the, it, it was at the point where the series just ended up becoming a shell of its former self. That's probably the right yeah. expression to get into. Uh, let's see now. I've never heard of a story where an animation director got so greedy with an adaptation property in my life. Hearing this was a huge stock... Uh, hearing this was a huge shock for me since I'd expect him to acknowledge that Watership Down wasn't his creation. At least Don Bluth knew... Uh, he never created the Rats of Nim. Then again, I'm sure this is not the only story that we would hear that we would hear of this. Yeah, for an mm -hmm. animated adaptation, like this is probably brand new, but I'm sure this has happened plenty of times with um, with like live action adaptations and stuff. Like you, you well, technically like with animated, well, th like for animated films per se. But with uh, adaptations, like you brought, you brought a great example up with the Boondocks. But I'm sure there are plenty of uh, live action adaptations where they, where like the creators themselves, rather it be the studio or the directors, would take advantage and try to make it their thing instead of the original author. And I don't mean like the creative sense. I mean like later on. Uh, in terms of mm -hmm. its legacy to try to twist the narrative to make it look like I'm the one who made this story. Uh, let's see. Like the studio era of films, like those are like considered the greatest films of all time. And like they, all of those movies, they're like so important that like they're all, all based on books, but like nobody ever really acknowledges the fact that, that like a lot of them are like based on books. Like, I think like Citizen Kane might be like an adaptation. Like there's like so many that are like Psycho, for example. Like there's so many that are like uh, adaptations and like really, really important films. But like the films become the definitive version. I don't know how the directors like handled that. They could attribute to it, but at, at the same time, it kind of does become easy to be to like slip in there and say, "Oh yeah, this was this was all me. Like I came up with this." I think it's just, it's ego. All this, it's essentially ego. Sometimes it gets the best of them. And in in a place like Hollywood, it could be way too easy to slip into it, especially like when you're handed millions of dollars and an entire mm -hmm. crew to create an entire feature. So I, I think... Yeah, when you're told that like, the film is like one of the most important films of all time, it's going to get to you at a certain point exactly like so like it, it will affect your psyche you know it, it, it's like it, it's like like when, when you create one of the most important one of the most important movies ever it's kind of like winning the lottery afterwards mm -hmm. like you're in a new position in a new claim to fame to the point where you immediately need to go and hike and hire a therapist to make sure you could stay grounded onto earth instead of like letting your mind slip away into a new fantasy world where you think you're more important than you are. Yeah, that's a fact. Yeah, all right. Let's see what else do we got. At the day and age where injustice is, thrown, is frowned upon, it's nice to see this week uh, where times, uh, where justice is rightfully served on a silver platter, even without mentioning the arrest of the cops that killed George Floyd. But really, it's great that Richard Adams can stand up to the guy who's honestly a major dick. I mean, uh, you gotta give Tom Hooper credit. Uh, at least he acknowledged that it was, uh, that the property was still that of Weber. Yeah, yeah definitely true. Um, let's see now. Oh, okay, we'll go with this one. 
Well, this can only be a great thing, and don't forget the fact that uh, he got to make the movie he wanted to make with BBC's CG remake of Watership Down on Netflix, uh, star, uh, star and James McAvoy, and music by LGBT musician Sam Smith. O okay, I guess referring to the 2018 adaptation. I'll go and read one more before we'll jump into the next story. Uh, okay. This uh, this is definitely crazy. A court case that lasted 40 years is insane. Okay, well, okay, this is not... No, no, no. The situation happened for 40 years. It's not something that... Like, the court case itself didn't last for 40 years long. It's just the situation itself uh, where it just bubbled up to the point where uh the estate had to take martin rosen to court so just to clarify that and i think this guy has a big ego uh this also does remind me of the spider-man rights and people debating whether disney or sony owns the rights yeah that th yeah that's another can of worms right there that's more complicated than this oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> i don't even like thinking about like just like a way just like that like weird web of just like like i was saying earlier it's just like so many different hands and like a pot yeah exactly it's hard to know like who what like who would be considered the original creator of that when like now there's just too many people that are involved with it at once especially with something like spider-man where and even like with the mcu films where you don't know where, which side is from disney which side is from sony which side is from the directors and which side is from the executives it's just way too complicated yeah, man. All right, but with that said, let us now go and jump onto the next story. And uh, speaking of the boondocks and stuff like that, uh, I would like to go and ask you one question, Tariq. Speaking of HBO Max, do you do you have HBO Max? I don't. I was I was going to. Um, then I heard uh, some of my friends' reviews of it because they got it the day of, and I was. And I kind of got a little, I step, I step back a little bit. I still might get it eventually, but not right now. That is actually pretty interesting. And I am sure that you are not alone on this because so far it doesn't look like HBO Max is off to a good start. Uh, two analysts from Moffat Nathan, uh, Moffat Nathanson have stated that HBO Max's opening from last week on uh, May 27th was a little bit disappointing uh, a little bit disappointing in fact if they would have to go and grade it they would give it a c plus which is good but you know it's only passable it's definitely not great and for the reasons why they have accredited to several reasons number one being the fact that its greatest asset is also its its biggest problem the amount of content that is in there in fact, there is just way too many things happening at the same time where they describe it as a uh, uh, they, they describe it as chaotic with the mess br mess of brands that they've got. In comparison, they've also talked about Disney Plus where they praise that they've organized it very nicely where they would just separate it to five different brands in which they call it a theme park approach uh, with Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, National Geographic, and of course Disney. But when it comes to the brands that are featured with HBO Max, they stated the brands don't resonate the same way because they aren't as clear. Another reason that they have mentioned that it didn't really work out well in terms of the opening is mainly because they felt like it was such a lost uh, a lost opportunity that they don't have anything to debut it that's an HBO Max exclusive. They don't have anything that's a major eye catcher to make people say, oh, we got to get the streaming service to see this thing in the same way of uh, The Mandalorian was for Disney+. Plus. Now, to be fair, they originally planned to have a reunion of friends to be that, but because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. that did not actually happen. Other reasons they have stated why it didn't go off on a great start is because of the lack of distribution on Roku and Amazon, and also because of the expensive price of $15 a month. So, Tariq, what are your thoughts on this? Do you feel the same way with uh, what they are saying? And also, like, considering you have mentioned about the reviews from your friends, um, can you expand upon some of the stuff that they have said? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So like my friend, um, Astro Box from uh from the round table, he was telling me about how like, um, he got it like at launch, and he was telling me about how like the Cartoon Network selection is a little weak, and it's like. They have like Steven Universe, but they don't have Steven Universe Future, or they don't have the film. They don't have the one theatrical film that Cartoon Network did for some reason, the Pop Up Girls movie. It's like a lot of things that are just like, really? That's not okay. Like, that's just kind of, I do appreciate though that like, you know, shows are like in order, which is like something that I shouldn't feel like I should like graduate something on, but like this seeing like, it's in Ferb and Recess in like really weird orders <laughs> on Disney Plus. Like the roller coaster of Phineas and Ferb episode is like number 18 or something weird like that. Uh, uh, Disney Plus. But um, I don't know. When I read it and uh, found it interesting that they were talking about how like brands aren't really clear because I could, I could totally get that. But I think that's the thing I kind of like about. I think I like the fact that it kind of reminds me of like um, Netflix first started and it just kind of, it was like turning on TV and then just like looking through and seeing what was on. There was like so many different kinds of shows and so many different uh, you know, things you could look for. Like, whereas I think like from a marketing standpoint though, I think like uh, the new Plus had the upper hand when they decided to distinctly tell you um, what to look for, like five really recognizable brands. And they didn't classify the Simpsons as a brand, but like they used them in the advertising. So you knew exactly like knew that they were going to be there too. And that's like the most important series ever made. So like, of course, people were going to go for that as well. Like I do think like all of that really did end up um to their advantage i don't think like the uh weird so sele- i think the weird selection could work in Max's favor. and i think that's what they were going for with um those billboards and using all of those different brands like you got like and elmo and rick sanchez like all in the same um and like all that stuff is like really cool but like i don't know i just I hope, for, I hope for the best like uh, I know that that the pandemic messed up the whole friends thing and like that would have been like been like really big that would have been really like important but like I guess it just kind of is what it is yeah I, I do I definitely do see your point and I do agree that it, it would have been like a major start to have that friends reunion uh to kick things off for HBO Max that would have been a big helper But I will say, though, I do understand where the analysts are going with in terms of, like, the brands all coming together and stuff where it seems a little too chaotic with HBO Max. Like, I I get it, honestly, mainly because we are at a point, like, when, when you talked about Netflix, like, I get why Netflix wouldn't necessarily need that because when Netflix started and when they started to become popular... There was no other streaming service like the, Netflix right. ha- was often regarded as the one streaming service that everyone would go and dump their uh, content onto. But now we are at a point that with the streaming wars where everybody is starting to separate themselves and now they want to have their own streaming service with their own brand of stuff. And especially like if I would say there is if there is one major game changer for that with the streaming wars, it would have to be Disney Plus. Like kind of Disney essentially defined that um, like if you're going to have a streaming service, it would really have to go and uh, highlight your brand with HBO Max. Mm -hmm. Technically, it's supposed to be the Warner Brothers um, streaming service, kind of like how the upcoming Peacock is going to be the universal streaming service. But when you do look at HBO Max, like it does seem a little bit confusing of the random of sort the random assortment of stuffs that they have that aren't necessarily theirs. Like, um, like I have seen, like I actually do have a picture here of, 
uh, what you are talking about with the billboard of all the random characters. And, like, in a way, yeah, it does seem cool that they would have, like, a wide variety of stuff. But then again, like, in terms of the brand, it doesn't seem to make sense where you see a picture where Chihiro from Spirited Away is right in the middle of characters like Rick Sanchez and Morty. And you also got Gizmo in front of her. And then you got uh, Huey on the side. And then you also got yeah. Aquaman and Doctor Who. And then Big Bird right behind them all. It, it, it just... <laughs> It doesn't make sense. It and also like you got Eric, Car like you got Air, like you got uh, like the South Park characters, like Eric Cartman. That's like not far from them. It, it feels like a, a fan made crossover you would find on DeviantArt than an actual piece of advertising. And on top of that, like I would even go and criticize the t the title itself of HBO Max that they're not taking advantage of their bigger brand, but they're just going with HBO. Which that in itself, you could argue, is a brand in itself that is only linked to several TV shows. You know, stuff like uh, The Sopranos yeah. or Game of Thrones or Westworld and, and, and uh, other shows like that. It's hard to really imagine HBO to be associated with stuff like Scooby-Doo or Looney Tunes. Or uh, like you got like in, in the far left corner, you got Will Smith who seems to be happy and pointing out that it's like, I'm with Dorothy! <laughs> Yeah, and they got like <laughs> they they got significantly younger Will Smith. They got fresh Prince Will Smith, which I think is funny because he doesn't look like that anymore. Oh, uh, yeah, that that is true. So I will say with the brands, it's more of a give or, give or take kind of thing. Where yeah, in a way, you could see that it is chaotic, but there is also that appeal that this is a a streaming service that does have a wide variety of stuff as well. But I will. Yeah. I feel like they might be like trying to play to the chaotic nature of it. They might not be trying to play it in the right way. But I think that's like I think that's what the point of like billboard like that, where it's like, yeah, these are like these are like things you normally wouldn't see next to it. And I think like they're trying to play to that, where like you're looking at it and you're like, oh, they got is that is that Huey? Like is is that Elmo? Like you know, you're just like looking at it and saying, oh, this is gonna be there and that's gonna be. I think that's what they were like into the most but yeah it kind of falls flat when you don't have big selling point that you're going to open with mm -hmm. like the mandalorian or like you know what i mean like something where it's like okay yeah i'm gonna get this to watch the shows that i either have on dvd already like, i've seen a million times but like i, I want to go there and say like oh, okay this is something i cannot get, get anywhere else you know what i mean and they don't really have a lot of those yeah, and and I and I will state that it's not necessarily HBO Max's fault. I don't blame them for this. I would blame more the current uh environment of the streaming services. Now that we have several of them released, now they got to be more associated with their own brands than actually like just putting out whatever. So it's just like times are changing and uh hbo max didn't really seem to get the memo on that uh, that that's where i would put uh, i would pin the blame on that aspect alone yeah definitely like i don't know it's just it's just it's just kind of um you're just uh hearing about some of the things that they like uh decided to safe for later because there's a lot of things that you really can't get anywhere else that just aren't there yet like I, I, my friends told me that and that he wasn't there i'm like you can't even they didn't even finish putting that on dvd like that would be that would be my first thing that i would put on there because it's like people will want to see that because they can't see it anywhere else you know what i mean like so mm -hmm. many different things like that but like you know craig of the creek's there but yeah cool like i love craig of the creek but it comes on tv every day you know what i mean like you you can get it somewhere but like a lot of the the things that aren't accounted for like like ed ed and eddie that's like really really important yeah. something with that you could put those there yeah um but on top of that um like in terms of the other factors though i will say like those ones are more legitimate than they would be debatable because uh, i remember i asked on social media for people uh why is it that you have or have not gotten hbo max and uh, a lot of people did respond that it is true technically that it's not available worldwide like so far it's only available to the u.s 
and th that that is understandable but um then there is the factor a lot of people state like probably if there is a, one complaint that is the most common i would have to say it's regarding the price where it's 15 dollars a month and so yeah, far man. so far this is the most expensive this is one of if not the most expensive of the streaming services and now that we are at a point where several streaming services are going to be coming out it like it's a bit much to add fifteen dollars a month to your budget, like with already it's the stuff lot. that you have to pay. Yeah, with the stuff that you already have to go and pay for the other streaming services, because a lot of people already have stuff like Netflix and Disney Plus and Hulu and Amazon and a few others. So it's gonna be so for them, it's gonna be hard to really fit if they want to go and add stuff like uh, HBO Max onto uh, onto their list of streaming services. I think HBO might be around that price. I think that's like uh, HBO Go. I think that's like around that price. I think that's what like maybe inspired. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's just it's just it's just like a really fifteen dollars. Like um, a Boomerang has this streaming service, and I've been kind of whether or not I want to give that a shot. Um, it's like they do have they have all of those like really weird throwaway Hanna-Barbera movies that like I've always wanted to see but like even Boomerang's like four dollars like yeah there's like it's not a big variety like um HBO Max but the point of these services at first was to eliminate like expense of cable but at a certain degree if everything you want to watch is so scattered around is going to become counterproductive and you're going to like end up paying more if you want all of these and you want to be like in the loop, if you care about that kind of thing, you know what I mean, like, I don't yeah. know, it's, it's, it's a weird, I don't know. It's just, it almost feels like we're like kind of going backwards in a way. Yeah. Ironically enough, we are going to be at a point where like, we're going to go back to cable. Essentially, we're going to have so many of these where these companies are going to try to go and take advantage of the situation and they're, they're going to go and release bundles that like oh if you pay for this service if you pay for uh this subscription you'll have these uh channels at once at a premium price or you can go into another one and you'll have all these channels for a different kind of price like we're we're ironically going like we're we're moving so for we're we're we're, we're like taking so many steps forward to the point that we're kind of starting to circle around where now it looks like we're kind of like going more backwards than we are forwards Yeah, it's like I don't know. I kind of I kind of talk, talk about this every time like something gets announced, and like it just kind of like pushes my mindset towards that more and more. It's like it's just it's just like there's so much now to the point where like some people just kind of give up and don't really change in any of them. Like it's kind of like the um, nowadays I kind of talk to people and. So for for years it kind of became like oh, I don't watch anymore. It's like you know they'll just kind of catch something on Netflix or something like that. But now it's not even that. Like now it's like I just, just kind of watch YouTube, I guess. Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of people are gonna go where like they don't have to spend as much. You know what I mean, like, mm -hmm. and they're gonna it's gonna flip and these are gonna come obsolete if everyone's not too careful. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of like the, the dangerous aspect of it is that if people are not too careful, then stuff like this is just going to end up uh, collapsing in itself. And it could end up becoming a business where, like, it was prominently big and it was so big. And then, like, it'll be at a point where we will see a lot of streaming services suddenly collapse in itself because there's not much interest. In fact, like, I, I would even say that we are starting to see that right now. Um, are you familiar with, uh, Queeby? Queeby, uh, is that, a uh, that, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg? Is that? Yep, that's Jeffrey Katzenberg's streaming service, and so far it is yeah. doing terribly. Like, it, it, it's going bad. I even, like, I didn't even know it was happening. I, like, found out, like, it's like, I found out, like, on, like, a whim. I found out on, like, an article saying that it was doing bad, that, like, it happened. I didn't even know that was going on. 
Yeah, and that's and that's like probably that'll end up becoming a prominent example of what streaming services don't want to be because it had such a terrible start. It was all like even before its release, it got so controversial with um, with like trying to distribute it and handling uh, the rights and stuff like Jeffrey had a real hard time to try to release uh, re release it. And not to mention that they kind of like he kind of made Queeby as like mobile exclusive or something like you can't even put it on your television. It, oh, it's honestly God. weird. <laughs> but yeah what's on that what is like what does that have and that's another thing i don't know if you would ask me like what shows would i want to watch on quibi i would have absolutely no idea like i i'll say this is just like um like all i know about quibi is that it's jeffrey katzenberg's streaming service and that's it he he would put the DreamWorks movie there. Hey, uh, sound like something he would do. Nah, nah. I well, he doesn't have the rights anymore. I believe, like he like DreamWorks Animation has been completely sold to Universal. So if anything, it's all gonna go on right. Peacock. Oh man, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's not even. Uh... Oh, go on, sorry. I was saying it's not even like uh, it's not even everything he's like everything like really really prominent and important he's done he's done it for like the people I guess like you, DreamWorks you can classify like yeah he did it for himself but like yeah, he doesn't own that anymore so like uh, I don't even know what would be on that like I think that's the thing is like people don't even like like putting this stuff out and like people don't even know what they're going for it's like the oasis thing like nobody knew what that was supposed to be like yeah oh my god the o yeah that is true any updates on is that even still a thing or does that even exist? i don't know I, <laughs> I have no idea all i know is at a certain point he asked for more money and then i don't know what happened after that like i don't i haven't heard him talk about it he's just been kind of when he's like zoom interviews which he hasn't really been um, talking about that much. I don't know if like, like things will slow up. I don't know if he still wants to do it. I have no idea. I mean, he already got more than a quarter of a million dollars on it. Like yeah. something has to happen. Yeah, you can't just like hold that money. It, it has to be some kind of update. There has to be. He hasn't. If it has been, it has to. It it, it most likely happened with um. I'm telling the backers because there's not anything as far as I know there's nothing on the channel like updating about any of that he's still the same thing on the channel I still asking people if they grew up with fairly odd parents and telling them that he created their childhood and stuff like that like all of that stuff is still happening so I have no idea like what, what the priorities were with uh Oasis and like what yeah, I I think it, it is still some, yeah like we I think that would be a question that we would have to ask if someone actually did donate to uh, Oaxis. Like that that would be someone that would know the answer the most to know if we if we do know if uh, Oaxis is something that is legitimate and that is still happening for Butch Hardman or that if the speculations are true and that it could be a scam. It's like in general, it's just like a really weird pitch. It was just like, yo, I'm gonna uh do this thing and it's gonna have like a bunch of different original shows it's gonna be like uh animation is gonna be gardening but there's no like concepts he showed concepts of the shows he was gonna do but like yeah it's just it, it kind of goes into what we were talking about with like even like what jesse Kass jeffrey kassenberg was doing it's like can't just say streaming service you know what i mean like, like there has to be something else to get people to go, you know, Disney Plus was really good at that by establishing a brand that was going to be there. HBO Max tried to do that, but they tried to play up the chaotic nature of it. But at least you know what's there, though. You know, at least you know, like, 
getting into you see the billboard and yeah it looks like a weird clash of just like all these different properties but you can look, look at that and say okay this is going to be there and this instead of saying like oh have you gotten the jeffrey katzenberg streaming service like i don't what does that even mean like i don't i don't know what's like on that i don't know what i would be paying for yeah, but, you know, if, if there is one thing that I will say to look forward optimistically in terms of HBO Max is that so far it's not off to a good start, but maybe things can pick up. Like, maybe soon we will see them expand onto things and also, like, especially expand onto different platforms as well because another major reason is uh, for, for why people didn't really get it yet is because it's not available on uh, devices like Roku or on Amazon. Like, that is something that should be yeah, a bit of a yeah. priority for them. So if, if they could get onto that, then maybe it could help them out. And also, like, pretty soon we should have more exclusive content. I mean, yeah, sure, they got the Looney Tunes cartoons, but that's not necessarily a big must-have reason to go and get HBO Max for the public. Like, pretty soon, maybe in the future, we will see some stuff that could really get HBO Max some attention and get some traction going. So, like, for now, we could say they're not off to a great start, but maybe things can get better in the future. Yeah, like, not, not being available on, like, devices like Amazon and Roku is, like, that's... Those people, like, look at stuff like this. Like, that's, like... Right, that should have been like the first priority. It's like to make sure that all of that was in order. Um, things been kind of moving as dates, whether it be a film, a TV show, or whatever. Like, I don't, I'm, I don't think people would go too big a fuss if they had to move the date to negotiate something. Like, because yeah, that one thousand percent that affects launch. Like, the most prominent ways people consume today and you're gonna tell me i can't download that on like what i had obstacle and like i mean services are supposed to eliminate the obstacle of like a lot of things and that just kind of creates another one where it's like well if i can't get to it i gotta what i gotta do i gotta hook my i gotta hook my like laptop up to the tv like oh you know, this is it adds too much like that, that kind of stuff just adds no, I, I, I definitely do agree, man. I, I guess we will have to wait and see with how things will go, but yeah, it's not looking promising for HBO Max. But now with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, what do you think about the opening of HBO Max? Do you think it's going well? Do you think it's not going well? Also, if can you ask me if you have HBO Max or not? And if so, why? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, let's see. Uh, Looney Tunes is more popular on HBO Max than Game of Thrones. With many subscription streaming service currently doing better than usual as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, now appears to be the time for new shows to launch. At least, uh, And at least HBO Max is better streaming services than Amazon Prime when it comes to technology. Well, yeah, you're definitely right there. And yeah, it's true with Looney Tunes. Like, they are definitely more popular than Game of Thrones in terms of the statistics there. But what I meant is that with the new Looney Tunes cartoons, they're not like a major reason for people to get HBO Max. It's not something that HBO Max is prominently advertising to say like, come check out HBO Max, we got Looney Tunes cartoons. It's, it's not like they're Mandalorian per se. Like, uh, yeah, as anticipated as it is and many animation fans really excited about it i wouldn't necessarily call it a a, a serious attention grabber yeah i think that's just one of those because i was thinking about that too when i was reading it and how it was just kind of kind of generalizing it was kind of saying that there aren't any original that people are going for but it's people like us are going to lose you know what i mean but like we aren't the grand majority of like what hbo max is like looking for and like who they're looking to grab like i feel like that was an important opponent um people like us especially like um it's like in the same vein as something like i guess like the snyder cut where it's like okay yeah we're gonna get like the do this there's like a whole a bunch of other people that's gonna come um 
about what we're doing. Uh, the fact that they really got screwed over with that friends thing, because that would have been humongous. Like that would have, mm. would have done everything that everything that this article was saying that like needed that one specific thing. It would have it would have helped like so much more because that's one of the most popular series like ever. You know what I mean? And if you have that, if you have that in your pocket, that's like it can scare anybody. Like that. I can scare any ounce of the competition, but like when you don't have that, you still have to up and you still have to do what you got to do. It's like, yeah, you kind of got to depend on like little smaller things that you have. Like the Looney Tunes cartoons are are great. The um the ones I've seen, I watched a couple that they put on their channel. Mm-hmm. Like the they're, they're great, they're dope, they're really beautiful looking, they're really well animated, and like it's like that's not. Uh, it's not enough, especially since they're like giving a a good taste of it, like free on YouTube too. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, they 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 advertise, yeah, they advertise the Looney Tunes uh, cartoons very well, but it's just um, with HBO Max, is it's like a platform. The thing is, is that I I guess you could say that is kind of a disadvantage of uh hbo max having so many content like they they've archived so many different shows and stuff like that that like they you know they prominently advertise like oh we got this we got this we got this but they don't really have anything to say that here's something new that you can only find here i guess that's one downfall of its marketing uh there's like a a trailer they put out like maybe a couple of days ago. All these days kind of bleed together. I think it was a couple of days ago they put out this trailer that had um like more things you could expect on there. And there's a part at the end where they say more shows coming next year, and they just like flash the names on the screen. I can't even read that. Like there was a Tom and Jerry thing somewhere in there, and like just like a bunch of in it. There's no picture. There's no like cast listing. It's just like a bunch of names, and a lot of them really based on preconceived property so it's like i don't even know like what any of this is i don't know why i should be excited for any of this is like because i don't know what i don't know what any of like what i'm looking at here mm-hmm. good point um let's see now i think the biggest problem with hbo max uh is the marketing and title most people are confused with how hbo max uh since they don't understand what the difference is between hbo go and hbo now uh, should have made a Harry Potter spinoff show to get people's attention like Disney did with Mandalorian. Uh, I think they should have used a better name. Even John Oliver is confused and he's on it. Uh, let's hope the Snyder Cut saves them. Disney and fans exist, but nobody is an HBO or Warner Brothers fan. Yeah, that that is definitely true. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah sure. uh, let's see. I'm re- I, I'm really worried with this streaming with the streaming wars and how there is too many of them. Uh, I worry that it'll lead to bratty people who will pirate uh, just to make things easier for them. That's not fair to the people working on the original content uh, on the exclusive services. Uh, I don't want to damage my computer just to see stuff I can't find on Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu, or HBO Max. Yeah, honestly, like ever since people like ever since the the notion of streaming services first existed, like when when they re, when they first pop up, knowing that we would have so many ser- uh, services like Disney Plus and HBO Max and Peacock and stuff, I've seen a lot of people making memes that they're ready to go and pirate their content instead of buying all these streaming services at at, at once. So yeah, unfortunately, this is also going to be a major problem where piracy is going to be coming back to the mainstream and it will return as a bit of a problem that could actually really hurt these uh, streaming services. Uh, Tariq, still there? Hey, I'm here. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I just... I don't know it's like like i was saying like all this like it's becoming like chaotic almost just um, i don't know where to turn all of these like services and they're all like all over the place 
like, even yesterday I was like organizing my DVD collection and I was just looking at all of these and it's like, I don't even really need any of this anymore. Like everything's apparently online and everything's like streaming or whatever. Like granted, I'm like, not gonna get DVDs. Like I love DVDs. Like I, I always have, but like, it's weird how like, you get a movie on DVD, you just kind of own it. You know what I mean? You don't have to pay, pay for it monthly. Like, so in a way, like, this going to kind of glorify, like, that practice again. Like, having it. Mm-hmm. Nah, Especially, it, like, now when you get a movie digitally, too. Like, even, not even just that. You get a movie on DVD. There's, like, a code in there. So it's, like, you could get it digitally, download it. It's, like, you have it now. Yeah, that yeah, that is true. Like that that that's often been a thing going on for years. So, and, and I guess that's kind of an entire debate in itself uh, regarding like the future of physical media like DVDs and Blu-rays, and if they would even survive uh, during these uh, streaming service days. So that that's going to be something we would have to wait and see if that's going to be a market that people would still be interested in getting. But I don't know, like a lot of people are saying this could be the downfall of it. Some people are saying that it could be, uh, you know, they'll still be relevant. But that's just something that we will have to wait and see on. And I mean, I'm I'm definitely a Blu-ray and DVD collector myself. And like so far, they're still at it. They're still going with it. But we'll, we'll see how strong the market is going to be like once the streaming wars are really going to be in full swing. There's a struggle and there's a fight for that kind of stuff. Like they, they stopped the Simpsons at 18, even though they made that atrocious season 20 DVD already. So it was like everybody was like really, really praying that they would like release 19. Not really because people think the episodes are good, but so it could solve everybody's OCD for having seasons one through eight. Yeah, that is 19. true. Yeah, like um. Didn't they didn't they actually just release a season 19 or is it just 18? Oh uh, yeah, they they finally did it. They finally did it. I think okay. Fat Tony's on the cover. Um they finally did it, but it's like go after that. Who knows if they're going to do 20 again or the 20, the 20 DVD is weird. Like that was like my Simpsons love era. So I have it and like it was like I was just listening to the commentaries all the time and there there aren't any on that there's no special features on the um season 20 dvd it was just like a really bad release and i have no idea if they're gonna do that again or if they're gonna i don't know try season 21 like this they i could i could understand how they could just kind of feel like there's no point anymore like even with those commentaries man they used to i don't know if you knew about the uh simpsons world the fx app they like had every episode on there they had the commentaries on there and i was yeah. life like i was like listening to those every day <laughs> but um, for that now no i i do know what you mean I, I i definitely i am familiar with simpsons world and i actually do have the uh d the 20th uh dvd like the 20th season and stuff and i do get what you mean like it was very disappointing where it's literally just the episodes like little to mm-hmm. no bonus features it was like eh, really that's it this is how you're gonna celebrate the 20th anniversary it's like ugh. Yeah, the the um uh, what's the the super stars me guy's name um, uh super oh Mor- morgan uh spurlock yeah, Morgan for the uh, the doc that he did. Remember, he did that doc about the Simpsons around that time. That's not even on the DVD. There's like a trailer for it, I think. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, that is true. This is such a it's such a disgusting like DVD release. Like I I have no idea why they did that, but like I don't know. That's just, I, I could get like nitpicky about that. Dude. That was the first time I got it. When I was a kid, and I was like, what is this? Like I can't even like get the disc out. Like it was it was weird. Yeah. All right. So I'll read one more and then we're going to jump on to the uh, next story. Uh, As someone that has HBO Max, I found the service to be really solid, uh, to be really solid uh, with interesting content from Warner Brothers, TCM, Ghibli, 
uh, etc. It's unfortunate that HBO's Max is not doing well though, but I think it's getting better. Although a price drop would be benef would be uh, beneficial now. Yeah, if there is one thing that could actually really help them out, it, it could be a price drop. If they can drop it to like uh nine nine like at least nine ninety nine, then that would you know that could actually be very very helpful. Yeah, man. Like every time I hear that fifteen dollars, man, that's steep. Like that's it's a lot. It's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, like just for one. Especially street. now, like nobody's like working. Like AdSense is terrible. Like a lot of money. Yeah, like especially with something like HBO Max, where it's just one streaming service. Especially compared to like Disney or even Netflix. Now it's just I don't know, man. It's just it's it's not as uh. It's a little bit scary, especially compared to Disney, where they they put it at like what seven dollars a month. So yeah, yeah, that's just uh, that, that's that's nice. It's less manageable. It's like that might be even be. I remember Netflix used to be eight. Like that's even less than like what they started out with. Yeah, that those were the good old days. That's when Netflix was affordable. Yeah. <laughs> And they weren't trying to, like, crack down on, like, everybody using, like, their mom's password. Ah, uh, yeah, that that's true. But then again, like, the tradition of sharing, uh, share, well, not sharing uh, passwords, but sharing accounts, that still lives on. Yeah, for sure. Even though, like, like um, school, he doesn't really, I don't, I don't think he knows how egregious what he's doing uh, how egregious what he's doing is with like that line about like paying for Netflix or whatever, but like, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Right. No, 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 nothing stopping anybody. Everybody's like nobody pays for anything. <laughs> exactly. If there's if there's a way to not pay for something, they'll they'll definitely find a way to do it. All right. So with that said, let's go and jump on to the next story that we have. And uh, I don't know how long it has been, or if you ever have. Um, I would like to know, have you, um, when was the last time you've seen Atlantis, the Lost Empire? Ooh, um, a good seven or eight years, a long time ago. Dang. I remember, I remember it enough to know how I felt about it. I remember enough to go like, kind of drag, but it was, it was such a beautiful looking movie, but like. I remember it being kind of like, okay, this is like around when they were trying to do something a little different and like they weren't really sure which way to go. And there's like, like a lot of characters here, but none of them really get to do much. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I, I definitely understand how, how you feel. It was a, it was a very strange period for uh, Disney. Uh, but that now this isn't necessarily like a piece of news or an announcement or anything but this is actually a very interesting discussion so uh what i am talking about is going to be regarding the possible idea of what would have happened if they did make a sequel to atlantis the lost empire Collider has had a little bit of a chat with Kirk Wise, which you may know as uh, not only the co-director of Atlantis, but also the co-director with Gary T Truesdale on films such as The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Beauty and the Beast. And uh, they had a little bit of a chat regarding uh, Atlantis and some of his past works, and they have revealed that apparently they did actually wanted to make a sequel to Atlantis The Lost Empire. And I don't mean like a little directive video sequel. It's not going to be something like Atlantis Milo's Returns or like the proposed series that they wanted to make that did end up becoming Atlantis Milo's Returns. Um, what did actually happen is that um, they originally wanted to do like a full-on theatrically released sequel of Atlantis that would be made by Disney Animation. Now, from there, um, even though he did reveal that that was supposed to be something that would happen, but um, he didn't really remember all that much. Kirk Wise didn't really recall what was even the name of the title, but he did remember what would have been a major plot twist to the movie. And uh, he stated, reading from my source here on Collider, 
Uh, we were going to have a new villain in the story. The villain was going to be wearing big, scary, wool, bulky, World War One style clothing with a frightening gas mask to obstruct its face. A little Dark vader -esque. And uh, this villain was going to try and retake Atlantis and finish the job that Rourke was unable to accomplish. And the big twist in the climax of the movie is that the villain is unmasked and it turns out to be Helga Sinclair. Plot twist. But, uh, <laughs> yes, um, but you might recall that in the original movie, Helga died. Like, she fell down yeah, to her yes, doom. <laughs> she, like, dies. Well, apparently, there is a solution to that. Um, apparently, Kirk Wise stated that, okay, so apparently she survived the fall and, be and became an early 20th century cyborg and started her own team of mercenaries. So that seems to be the big thing is just uh, revealing a little piece of history that originally they wanted to do a sequel. And even though we don't really know what was the title of that thing or what the general plot was about, we do know that there is a plot twist that Helga would have survived the fall and she would have become a cyborg with her own mer mercenaries. So Tariq, how do you feel about that? Sounds like a mess. I love it. <laughs> of everything about that. <laughs> oh I was like a mess. Like, I love that. It's like, oh, yeah, she's a cyborg now. Like, she's back. Like, I love that. That's so, that's so weird. Yeah. There, honestly, there is a part of me that's one. Like, they, they probably had a full on explanation for this, but there is a part of me that's just thinking, how? Like, how? Like, especially this is supposed to be um set in like the eight the in the late 19th century early 20th century and yet um like now they're they're proposing an idea of like turning someone into a full-on cyborg after falling down after like a major almost fatal fall like they and uh, ironically enough like what kirk wise said is very much true where it is dark vader-esque where like, it's someone who is so damaged, very close to death, and then suddenly, just with uh, technology, is turned into a cyborg, just like with Darth Vader. So, I don't know what they would do with, like, I don't know how they would even pull that off, or how they would even properly explain the scenario that Helga managed to survive, and, um have all this to happen it, it, it's just and where did she even get the mercenaries like that would be something that would need a lot. so many questions <laughs> yeah that that seems to be a very specific thing to go and remember and yet there are some other factors you need to go and discuss and and bring up that that's the real problem here is the lack of information because like hearing about this plot twist alone without really knowing more about the story or really know the context of how they want to expand the world, it, it just seems really confusing. So I, I don't know, like just hearing this plot twist alone, it's just like, yeah, it's not, I don't, I don't know if it's really as great as it sounds, honestly. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, there's a, there's a very, very big chain universe twist. It's like, like animation fans like, like disown it. Like we we probably don't talk about it that often, but like, it's one of the, it's like a uh, you have from it now. It's like okay, we don't have to live with this actually existing. Um, so we can laugh about how insane this idea is. We don't have to. We don't have to endure it. Was, it's not, never gonna be in front of us because they're never they're never gonna do it like it's never those things where it's just kind of like yeah, right yeah that that is definitely true that this is just something we could just look back and just have a laugh because like we know this is not gonna happen like it's, it's not gonna be something that they're just gonna magically bring back for disney plus uh, and especially like even even right now, like in terms of its status in pop culture, yeah, it is pretty popular. People are familiar with it, but it's nowhere near in the same status as something like the Emperor's New Groove or like the Disney uh -huh. uh, the, the Disney classics. So it's not something that Disney is in a rush to go and create or add more into it. So I don't like even if they would make a sequel, I don't think they would add this element. 
it's definitely the end of like that era. Like it's not Emperor's New Groove. It's definitely not like Levo and Stitch in terms of like um what people um remember from like that time period, like that whole era of just like right after the Renaissance and stuff. It's definitely like on like the lower end of that. Like I wouldn't say that like nobody's seen it or nobody remembers it like something like dinosaur or something like that but it is it is like a very low chance that they do i've always kind of thought that if disney wanted to keep doing these live action things if they if they if they felt like if they really felt like they had to always kind of felt like they should give a crack at the movies that aren't perfect so like this was always kind of the ones that i thought it was like I don't think I would care if they did this. Like Atlantis is one of those where it's just kind of like if you want to, you have to. Like I don't. You, there's ways to improve it. Like Beauty and the Beast is like the perfect movie. Like there's no reason for you to, you know, what I mean, just like step in there and say, "Oh, let's add this. Or let's take this out." It's like no, it's, it's a perfect movie. I made it for Best Picture. Like it's like what are you doing. You know what I mean? But y- no. I always kind of felt like you know, like this or even when they did Peach Dragon. Like yeah, a lot of talked about but it's not you know yeah like the gods here yeah it's like with um with with pete's dragon funny enough it's like yeah technically it's like they might have improved it just a little bit but it's definitely not as memorable as the original and especially if it, it didn't like it plays too safe to the point that it doesn't even capture like some of the insanity of the original Peace Dragon. If you haven't seen the original, oh my god, like it's it's like one of the cheesiest movies out there, but it's like enjoyably cheesy that you can have a good laugh at. But uh, no, but I completely agree with you with what you have said regarding the elements of like the the live action remakes and stuff. And yeah, like uh, Atlantis the Lost Empire is definitely one of those that could definitely work out as a live action remake mainly because uh, it's not a perfect movie, but it definitely has a lot of potential and does bring up a lot of amazing and great ideas where if someone else can get a crack at it to try to go and improve some stuff, then it could actually work out very, very well. And like, even if they, and even like, I wouldn't be opposed to an idea of actually working on a sequel where they can actually fix up a lot of the problems from before. Like, maybe they'll find a way to go and improve it in terms of expanding the world of Atlantis, of what they want to go and build on it. Like, and they and they already even mentioned that they want to do a fresh original take that would be outside of the proposed TV show that became uh, My- Milo's Return. So, it would pretty much opt mm-hmm. out that whole thing. So, honestly, like, the idea of a sequel or expanding or putting on a new take of Atlantis is a great idea. So, like with Atlantis, it's like they could have, could have did the thing. It's like that era where they tried to do the TV show and it ended up turning into the the Miles Returns film. It's like in a show in that era. But if they were to do it today, like they're doing with like Big Hero Six, well, like everybody's problem with Big Hero Six is that there's like so many people in that movie and like you don't get to care about any of them. Um, but like the show gives you the opportunity to. You know what I mean? When you're dealing with a format like that, um, you can kind of play around and uh, give characters their little nuances and figure out what makes them tick. And they could do that with these characters, like if they uh, if they ever went ahead and did this theory. You know what I mean, like maybe I don't know. It might not have been as um, what's the word I'm looking for. It wouldn't have been as like detailed or nuanced. As if, if they were doing it today, if they did it back then, it probably would have came off like Tarzan and Jane. Not Tar- Tarzan and Jane is a movie. It would have came off like The Legend of Tarzan or something like that. But like, they would have did it today. It would have like, I don't know, I feel like it would have like flourished, especially that like angular hockey art style that they did too around that time. Oh, yeah, true. I think it would, I think, um, well, I, I, I'm not up to that point yet to go and fully do the research on it, but I believe it was, um, yeah, Mike Mignola, uh, Mike Mignola, the guy who did the Hellboy comics, uh, like he was the one who helped out with their design, where it gave a new look to the, the to the characters that goes a bit beyond of the regular Disney style. 
it's just, it's a beautiful movie like it's like looks so good and like it's one of the um few disney movies that, like I feel like the palette is like really important like the color palette is like so important oh, and like yeah. what makes that movie look the way that it does it's like it's really like heavy on like the the light blue and like when it doesn't do that it's really like um i mean it's a lot of animated movies at least not mainstream over here that like look and feel that way you know like and i think it has like a very very like nice specific look to it another one that kind of does that is treasure planet treasure planet plays with like the the, the browns a lot um mm. or probably the, really the the best example i gotta say sorry to interrupt but probably the best example that i can think of is actually disney's aladdin that is a movie that knows very well how to treat colors um way better i think he's coming Uh, still there, Tariq? Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't, my my uh, computer was cutting out for some reason. Can oh, you hear okay. me fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you fine. Did you hear what I said, or uh... I heard you talking about like Aladdin and how like really why they deal with yeah, the color like pattern. How... I completely agree. Like Aladdin is like a really like you ever watch Aladdin in like uh, 1080p? Like it's so bright. Like, like it's like a really pretty movie. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Especially like, especially like, like there, there are just a few colors that they would highlight, but they work out very well. Like with the blues or the yellows, uh, the reds, mm -hmm. the pinks. Like it, it works out. Like they, they know how to make just a simple color and really make it a massive highlight of uh, of the movie to really set the tone. Aladdin is like it has um thing about Aladdin's color palette is that it like kind of calms itself down but it does grab from like a lot of different colors where like Atlantis and um Treasure Planet those two are almost kind of monochromatic in a way like they like like Atlantis kind of just like says like okay we're we're doing blue you know what I mean and like everything is kind of like that tint and, and like the planet says okay we're doing brown and everything is kind of like that tent you know what i mean like yeah yeah i i guess it's mainly to bring us to the to a new world it's like oh it's the underwater world of atlantis so it has to be blue or with treasure planet for example um it's the kind of film that's like oh we're still like we're still treating it like it's uh it's from the time period of treasure island so like we got to really emphasize the wood element and uh, like really make it brown to keep that classic feel because like, I, I guess you could say like setting set, like w when you think about like those old days of like 17, 18th century, like sailing adventures, like Browns are often more prominent. Yeah, yeah for sure. Like that, it definitely, Definitely, like like you were saying, it definitely does a good job of putting you in that like that time period and like putting you in that like other world. Um, I feel I always felt like that film, whatever problems people have with it, always kind of felt like one thing that always got really right. Its sense of um, atmosphere and like inviting you to like like wherever the characters are. And I don't know, but didn't the way that it was like color didn't feel like messing up any form of tone or anything it felt like it was really like in tune with itself and the way that it looked and the way that it was yeah but uh overall like with, with this i guess with the proposed idea is that like with the sequel it is a great idea like we wouldn't be opposed to it and more if there would be more atlantis to help reboot the idea or to expand the idea it would be great but with this plot twist in particular it, it needs a lot more of an explanation you can't just reveal that oh helga's alive she just uh she just turned into a cyborg yeah man that's nuts <laughs> i love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Or, or maybe like that, that could be it. Maybe that, that is just the plot. It's just that like, we do have a villain and it just turns out it's that 
Like, we don't explain the mis mer mercenaries. We don't explain the cyborg aspect. You just explain that it's that and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they if they if they if they just kind of they just kind of go up there and they just kind of say, "Look, this is what we're doing," and they're like really bold and like prominent about it. I will have my suspension of disbelief. Like I will after a while. It's like you can get to a glass ceiling with me where it's just like, "All right, you know what? All right, fine. If this is what we're doing. If we're going like this, then like I'm just gonna gonna put every guard down and I'm just gonna <laughs> enjoy what's going on at a certain point." Ah, uh, yes. All right. So with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to know how do you feel about a potential sequel to Atlantis The Lost Empire? Or like, how do you feel about the idea of it? And also, how do you feel about the idea of having the plot twist where Helga is alive and that she just became a cyborg? Let me know what you all think of this. Uh, let's see now. Uh, I could actually see I could actually see Helga able to obtain some mercenaries uh, since uh, we had the gas mask mercenaries in the movie. Even Rourke himself seems to be a mercenary, even though he calls himself an adventure capitalist. Uh, what I can't what I can't see, however, is Helga coming back, even if she survived the fall. The, vo the volcano erupting soon after uh, would more than certainly kill her. Though the plot twist with the <laughs> unmasking, would certainly be better than all the twist villains Disney spew out nowadays. Well, then again, I guess, like, if it worked for Anakin becoming Darth Vader, then maybe it could work out for Helga. <laughs> you never know. Just, I kind of forgot how hard they went when she died. Like, like yeah, it's like a volcano. Like, no, you can't. <laughs> That's so silly. Like, you can't do that. Hey, maybe the survival rate of falling into a pit of lava is much better than we'd think you never know maybe it, like we'll, we'll still live we'll, we'll 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 lose a few limbs but we could we could survive it <laughs> oh man <laughs> we'll just have the benefit of becoming a cyborg it's like the uh it's like in teen titans where a cyborg uh he says like his spirit is like the most important component of like how he's built it's like no man like it's not it. I know you're. I know you're trying to be like, like really poignant and poetic here, but like, there's like a motherboard somewhere in there. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there is a Yeah, there, there is a motherboard. There is something in there that is man-made that is keeping you alive. It's not because of your like your spirit or your soul. No, it, it's a computer chip that's keeping you alive. Yeah, come on. Right. Oh no! Like I said, I love it. I love it all. It's it's so great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I've seen the first Atlantis quite a bit where I was younger and considered it as an underrated film. But hearing that there were plans on a theatrical se sequel sounds kind of nuts, especially to the plot twist, uh, like what was uh, Milo, Kita, and the gang gonna do in order to stop a robo version of Helga. Either way, it's a shame it never came to fruition and instead got a mediocre direct-to-video sequel at best. Mm, de mediocre, mm, I'd even debate that. It's like mediocre would sound generous with uh, what we have seen with that thing. Ugh. I've never seen it. I just know it looks awful. It looks so bad. Yeah, it's... Uh... I'll just say there's a reason why the show never got made. I'll, I'll just put it at uh, I'll put it at that. It had a lot of potential, but uh, that that ain't it. Certainly not it. Yeah, no. That was like that weird era where like the direct to DVD movies. Some of them were the TV movies are like backdoor pilots. Like there's like so many Lilo and Stitches, but I think Stitch the movie was the pilot the show. Yes, yes, I think. Yeah, and then there was uh, yeah, and then there was another one that was supposed to be like the series finale that was supposed to be the yeah, Leroy, Leroy, and Stitch. Leroy and Stitch, exactly. Uh, let's see now. I think it would have been an interesting idea if we did get the Atlantis sequel. At least it would be better than Milo's Return, which was just a bunch of episodes of okay, yeah, we like we uh, have mentioned. Um, I'll read one more until we jump into the final story. Honestly, I don't know what to say about this. I would say I'd rather see a live-action remake of Atlantis than a better sequel to it, but 
Maybe I might change my mind. I will admit when I was a kid, I was kind of bored while watching the first time in cinemas. Uh, I did grow, it, it did grow on me over time, but it wasn't as, I wasn't as enthusiastic about it as Treasure Planet or Brother Bear, which came out years later, or I think just a year later. Uh, I will, um, well, a year or two. Uh, I will admit, if this was ever real, um, uh, we get to see Kidia again. She was robbed from being a Disney princess. Ah, yes, yeah. that old debate. <laughs> oh, actually, there is one more that I want to read. I love this idea of a sequel to Atlantis. However, I'm skeptical about the idea of Helga becoming a cyborg. Uh, it could look cool, but I'm just not sure how it would work out on the story. Uh, I would also uh, I would also be down for an Atlantis TV show if Disney were able to decide to do uh, with it, which I think it would be a better idea than a direct sequel. Also, apparently, if the show happened, it would have crossed over with Gargoyles, which would have been interesting. Yeah, that seems to be something that people have uh, pointed out, where they did mention that uh, with the proposed Atlantis series, there would have been one episode where they would have crossed over with Gargoyles. Which would be fascinating. Which would be interesting. It would it would actually fit well with the world of Atlantis. That would be especially since that that was that was I guess like since they didn't do that, I think Lilo and Stitch like picked up the weight of like that kind of energy because they Lilo and Stitch was just they were with everybody. They were proud family. Uh, proud family. I still it still recess. it beats me up that they got recess uh kim possible if i recall uh jake long yeah, american dragon yeah yeah St it, St stitch was hopping around on disney channel he probably would if he if, if he still had his tv show like had like we would have seen like my like with milo or with uh phineas and ferb like he would still be yeah. doing that sure we would have the, the amount of properties phineas and ferb are going to dance around with we would have definitely like Ended up there if that show was still running. It was just it was just really weird that like even after talking to Bruce W. Smith and he was saying like, Yeah, no, we had like the proud family. He's like, we had nothing to do with that. They just kinda like kind of came up to us one day and said, Yeah, we're gonna do this. Um he kind of just had to say okay. Like no cat no crew from the proud family was there. Like they got the cast members to record, but like other than that, they, they were just kind of writing the dialogue. <laughs> Like how they saw fit, I guess. Yeah, it, it was a weird thing. I guess it's probably the executives who wanted it more than the show creators, or I don't know. It it was a weird moment. It was a it was a weird thing with experimenting with Stitch. Recess one just trips me out because they weren't even on the air anymore. Like there was no, there weren't, they weren't making new Recess episodes like at all. Like that was like a done deal way before they put up there. I don't know. I guess I guess it's only kids that have to cross over with Stitch, and they they were limited. They were limited on their resources. They were probably right. They probably just didn't. nobody nobody wants to cross over with Brandy and Mister Whiskers. Like nobody wants to do that. So they probably just like yeah, hey, let's just have the other human kids. So I'm glad they didn't like Doug. That oh, would have been yeah. terrible. Oh God. No, that would no, no, please. We don't, we don't yeah, need no, that. I'm good. <laughs> Especially Disney, Doug. It's like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, Herman Melville. Oh, uh, yeah, but anyways, it is now time that we are gonna go and jump onto the grand finale with our final story. And I would like to know, Tariq, do you play video games? Like, are you a gamer yourself? Uh, I used to be when I was a kid, but kind of like I don't want to say I grew out of it because that's that's not that's not the case at all. But I kind of did just kind of stop. I really have you know. All right, but like at least you know the basics of like video gaming and what we need and stuff like that. Like we need a controller and we need a screen and all that kind of stuff. But just wondering, like w like if you would go back to playing video games and stuff, would the size of the screen matter? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so okay, so it does matter, but you hopefully you don't mind playing on a one inch screen. Like, can you handle that? Oh, absolutely not. I don't know. <laughs> one inch? No, no way. 
Well, apparently it is going to happen. There will be a console with that, and that is the Game Gear Micro. Yes, Sega has announced that in honor of the 60th anniversary, they are going to be releasing a special edition of their classic handheld console, the Game Gear, called the Game Gear Micro, which is a pocket-sized version of their uh, old console. And uh, with it, now they didn't necessarily put up any specifics uh, in terms of like the size and stuff like that for the Game Gear Micro, uh, except for the screen in which they stated it is going to be just an inch. Um, well, only a one inch screen and apparently will come in four different colors in which they each will have four different games. And before I get into the games, let me just go on Sega's official Japanese website. And there is this hand here that should give you a little bit of an example. Like, see how the index finger and the thumb is holding on to that little uh, Game Gear Micro? Like, it's supposed to be this big. So imagine a console of this size. So anyways, going back to... Uh, and uh, and if you, if you guys are only listening to this, uh, basically, how I'm holding it, it looks like it's just going to be two, inch, two inches tall so far and probably four inches wide. So it's going to be... A ridiculously tiny thing but going back into the games uh, what they have like I said they have four different colors with uh, four different games each that are included in there the black one will have Sonic the Hedgehog Puyo Puyo 2 Outrun and Royal Stone the blue one will have Sonic and Tails Gunstar Heroes Sylvan Tails and Baku Baku Animal Yellow will have Shining Force 1, Shining Force 2, Shining Force Gaiden, Final Conflict, and Nazuo Poyo Are no Drorux. And the red one will have Revelations, The Demon Slayer, Megami Tensei Gaiden, Last Bible Special, The GG Shinobi, and Columns. They have also uh, and they have also added that if you would go and buy all four of these consoles, then you would go and get a special accessory called the Sega Big Window, which will magnify the screen to be just a little bit bigger, but you have to go and buy all four of them. The price on the Game Gear Micro is going to be 4,980 yen each, which is uh, 40 pounds or $50. And uh, it will be coming out so far exclusively to Japan on October 6th. So, um, even though it's been a while since you've been gaming, Tariq, uh, do you think you want to go back to it with the Game Gear Micro? Oh uh, man, that doesn't sound like a good, uh, that doesn't sound like a good reintroduction. <laughs> well, why is it so small? Like, what? Yeah. Same. Yeah, I, I know. It's like, it's stupidly tiny. And at, at this point, I just would like to go and point out that a lot of people, of course, are going to bring up the Game Boy Micro, which was from the late 2000s that Nintendo did release. And, uh, oh my I, god, that happened, didn't it? Yeah, that, that was a thing. And I just want to point out, though, that I actually do have the uh, Game Boy Micro with me. I actually did use it when I was a kid. I actually went and bought it. And honestly, I really liked it. Like, this is honestly one of, if not my favorite version of the uh, Game Boy Advance. And uh, if you want to know, in terms of the screen size, it's actually twice as big. I actually measured firsthand with a ruler that it is uh, two inches, at least in terms of like screen size. And even in terms of the width, it is, um, I measured it was one and three quarters uh, inches, which is honestly not that bad. And yes, it is actually playable. Like you can actually see it. And considering that it is... Um, you know, it is a Game Boy Advance, which is like a 32-bit console, I believe. Like, so far, like, it actually shows a lot of the graphics uh, very well. It actually works out. It's a it's a really good console that actually does work, and you can actually see what you're playing. And even, like, when you're holding it, it is actually very, com it is actually very comfortable. It, it Like, the, the buttons are, are a good size, and it actually works. Like, as a console, it's very nice, and it's very convenient in terms of its size. So, imagine... Like, you take the Game Boy Micro, you have to shrink the screen, like, you gotta half the, you gotta make the screen half the size, and make the buttons even smaller. And even looking at the buttons, I gotta say, 
like if you do look at the like the comparison and stuff like that the like the two side buttons they look like the size of the regular thumb like how are you even supposed to press the buttons on this thing yeah man <laughs> it's nuts <laughs> And, and you know the irony of it, what I find to be the, the craziest thing and the dumbest thing is that in order to make it playable, you got to buy all of it. Like, you got to spend the average price of a console, like, you got to spend $200, and then you got to get, this so that you can actually go and get an accessory where you can actually see what you are playing. Like, how are you supposed to play Sonic the Hedgehog in a one-inch screen? How are you even supposed to see anything? Like, th that's my biggest question. How are you even supposed to see... It looks it? like a joke. Like, it looks like some kind of, like, weird joke. It looks like a uh, some kind of satirical thing that they would do on, like, The Simpsons or Family Guy or something like that. Like, just even, like, looking at the image of, like, the person with it in their hand. It's, like, so small. And the fact that, like, yeah, you got to go out and you got to... They kind of get you and, like, make your odds perk a little bit by saying, like, oh, it's, it's $50, but, like, yeah, each... It's like, it's like other ones that you got to do too. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I get it that they want to try to upgrade uh, the the whole situation. Yeah. And I even have a picture here. Like, yeah, this is what it looks like uh, trying to, like when someone is trying to hold it and like, oh my God, it looks like the person is struggling. It's like literally you, you, you got to be so gentle with it. And, and like the thumb is dominating all the buttons everywhere. It's like, how do you even play on this? It, it, like, it, it would seem like a joke, but then again, like, uh, what, I, what I'm guessing is that this is probably just meant exclusively as a collector's item. Like, yeah, it has the convenience of playing video games, but can you legitimately play anything on this? Like, is it even possible? Yeah, it's one of those things where it's kind of like, you know, I, I, I agree with you. It has to be like a collector's thing because, like, that's not buy a kid that, you know what I mean? Like, they're going to lose it. It's so easy. Oh, like, oh my God. Yeah. It's setting it, yourself up a failure to get that for your kid. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, the, you know, the sad thing is, is that considering its size and stuff like that, this is like one of those things that you could lose in the sewers. Like you're you're gonna be like on, yeah. on top of a manhole and stuff, and it it will go down between the cracks. It looks like it's one of those things that can be possible to do so. So uh, like I, I, definitely, I, you can put it in your pocket and you can sit down wrong, and it can fall out of your pocket. Like it is one of those things. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's more inconvenient than it is. Like I get the like I get the I, I understand the market of like mini things so like especially in japan that's actually a pretty popular trend of like buying stuff that are like smaller than the average size but uh, honestly like with a working console it's just it, it seems unusual but also if i would have to state like a reason why i wouldn't necessarily be too keen on getting it would be regarding the games because so far there really isn't a whole lot that's interesting that that it, that has piqued my interest so much like i'm not gonna go and immediately go and buy all four different versions like maybe i'll like if i would have to buy it maybe i would go with the black one to have regular sonic the hedgehog or maybe the blue one to try out sonic and tails to see what that is all about but other than that like honestly in terms of the games are they even worth getting it like if you look at it as a console yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. It's like, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Like it, it's kind of it, it does kind of akin back to like what we were talking about with like um, HBO Max. It's just kind of like in all the other streaming services. It's kind of like what am I getting into this for? Like I'm gonna pay like two hundred dollars for like this thing that I could easily lose. It's like I, I have to be doing it for a good reason. It has to be something attached to it that I'm going to it for. Mm hmm. I, I don't know. And especially with the gimmick of like, you, you, you know, the whole gimmick with the whole big window thing is that, yeah, there's not going to be much of a point because technically in the age of eBay, it's easier to get it without actually going through the whole process of spending $200 on all four of these consoles. You could just buy one thing and that's it. But 
Then again, in its defense, like it is exclusively to Japan and they are selecting content that is more um, appealing to Japan than it is in like North America, for example. Like if this would ever come to North America, then they would put they would put in more American appealing games. You know, they would put in stuff like um, uh, like I don't know. Well, honestly, it is the Game Gear. Actually, I don't know what popular games there would be on the Game Gear because I know that they did release uh, a mini version of Sega Genesis, and that actually went very well. Like a lot of people. Yeah, that did. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I think I know some people with it. Yeah, like apparently it was it was very good. Like some people would go as far and say that it's the best retro mini console that has been released. Like up there with uh, some of Nintendo stuff, like the any like with the uh, the NES Mini or the SNES Mini. Like so, like I, I do get what they're trying to do, and I do understand like why they want to enter into into this market. But when it comes to the Game Gear Micro, it's just like honestly, it's such a weird oddity in terms of video games that it's like it's one of those but why though moments it's like you you make it's like yeah i get it you want to make it small but do you have to make it that small i i like to see my games when i play i think it's kind of an integral part of gaming yeah definitely <laughs> it's the most important part i gotta be able to enjoy the experience without like squinting my eyes or like yeah if i'm like it's the right thing is um yeah and honestly like when this was announced i've seen on social media people sharing two popular memes regarding this like of course number one is that the the first comment people would make about this is the uh, zoolander one where they would go like what the heck is this a handheld for ants but one that i used actually it was the uh, Ken Jong one when he held that little piece of paper and like he's squinting real hard to understand like what's going on. Like he's just looking yeah. at like, what? <laughs> like honestly, like is, is this <laughs> is this the future of gaming that Sega wants us to do? We need to squint in order to play our games to see closely. <laughs> That's what it seems like. like. I don't I don't really get the God, I don't get the, and it's not even like they didn't even try to do anything cute with it and like put like a little keychain on the end of it or something <laughs> like something that warrants that that size. Yeah, that is actually true. That 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 would actually be a good idea for it. Like this should have been something that, like, should actually have a keychain. Like that, it, it seems like with that kind of size. Like I know technically some could say it's a little bulky for a uh, keychain, but. I mean, with, with with that kind of size, like even though it will be pretty big for your keys, like it would be pretty cool to have like a working console attached to your key set, like that that would actually be something that would work. That that would have actually worked. Like just you know, attach like just make it a, a keychain accessory where like if you're bored, then you could take out your keys and just play the games. Like you, th that yeah. would be that would be a pretty solid idea for it. It would definitely, like, put the cases of people losing it in half. I guess if you lose, if you lose, if you lose it like that, you, then you lost your keys. If you lost your keys, then it's just that's it's, 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 it's all downhill from there. Yeah, and that's why it makes it important. That's why you got to keep it if you want to keep your uh, like. And that's the thing. It's like yeah, it's a little bulky for a keychain, but at least it makes it easy. In a way, it ironically makes it easier to look for your keys so that you could just like where like okay where's that little game gear oh there it is there's my keys i can go into my car now how does like volume work on something like that like is it gonna be like as loud as like a normal handheld or is it gonna like is it gonna sound like a mouse it's so small uh... there's so many questions just from looking at it well i mean like there is like a little there's a little area for the uh, for the audio, and I guess yeah, it does have volume, but it does have a um, it does have a phone jack. Oh, and I actually do. Oh my god, actually, I have found the measurements. Actually, hold on a sec. Like the measurements of the console itself. Let me bring out my ruler. Okay, so apparently it says that the console itself is going to be 80 millimeters by 43 millimeters by 20 millimeters. 
So that's about, so, okay. So 80 millimeters is a little over three inches, three inches. So that's the width of it. 43 millimeters. So just to check that it's all, it's uh, one in one and three quarters inch. So that's how tall it's going to be. And, oh right. and how wide it's going to be is uh, 20 millimeters. So that's just three quarters uh, of an inch. Oh my God. <laughs> so small. Yeah. And I mean, like even my Game Boy mic. Yeah. Like even my Game Boy Micro, like it's four inches wide. Like, wow, this is, it's much smaller than the Game Boy Micro. Like, I was now, looking at, at pictures of the Game Boy Micro and like, yeah, they, they, they made it big enough at least like, cause you know, those cartridges aren't really that small. So like that helps them mm -hmm. in like, you can show that it had to be a little bigger than something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. I, I mean, like at least they made it come, like I, it's small, but they made it at a comfortable size that you can actually see what you're doing. This, however, it, oh my God, like honestly, this is making me appreciate more and more and more of the Game Boy Micro. I'll say this right now. The Game Boy Micro is an underrated console from Nintendo because it could have been worse. It could have been the freaking Game Gear Micro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's honestly ridiculous. Okay, so I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all... What do you all think of the Game Gear Micro? If it ever is available in your country, would you go and buy it? What are your thoughts on it? Do you think your hands are small enough to actually play the thing? And to, and, and are your eyes like supernatural that you can actually see something microscopic? Let me know what you think. Uh, let's see now. Um, I'll go with this one. I'm really not interested. This seems like something that would be a choking hazard. And I feel like it's something you could lose easily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I never thought I would see someone describe that about a gaming console. That it could be a choking hazard. That is something just show new. You how, like, where we are right now. Like, that shouldn't be a concern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? While I think the idea is interesting, the execution is a bit messy, and I would not mind seeing the angry video game nerd do a video on this in the future just to see his reaction. That would be interesting, actually. That, that would be something James Rolfe should consider on trying to check out. It will be much later, like in October, but still. That, that, that is a great idea, actually. That would make a, that would make a pretty good episode. Uh, let's see. I'll be pleased if uh, Game Gear Micro would be nice... Uh, if it's compared to the Game Boy Micro and its cartridge, well, that doesn't seem to be the case. And plus the fact that, may I point out that you're not going to be playing any of your, like, older Game Gear stuff. Like, it's only the four games and that's it. At least with the Game Gear, uh, with the Game Boy Micro, you can actually, like, switch on the games. It is a legitimate console. So there is that. Uh, let's see. Uh, may I also bring up the fact that these things cost $50 each, and if you want the accessory that magnifies the screen while you play, you have to buy all four. Yep, that's the thing. It's $50 each, and if you want to actually see what you're playing, it's $200, and you get this thing. Uh, like, and even at that, like, even if it does magnify, like, does it even magnify that much? Like, would it even be a sizable thing to play? I don't know. I, I really yeah, don't know. I don't know. Like, it, would it even work? And especially, also may I add, would it be too much in the way of your hands when pressing the buttons? Hopefully, like, they, they would think that, of course, but I, I don't know. It's just, like, it looks like something that would just be, like, in the way, like, when you're playing your little thing. Uh, let's see. This would be a great idea if it was two times bigger and uh, some of the and some of the Watch Mojo top ten Game Gear games on it had uh, for a, a lit screen like the Game Boy Advance SP. Then this should uh, this could work in the USA uh, also. Seeger is oh Sega is also doing a cloud gaming service for arcade cabinets called Fog Gaming. Well, that is another oh that does sound interesting. I'm not gonna lie. Hopefully that's not too expensive. 
Uh, I never heard of this console, but wow, they look small. Although, uh, I wouldn't be interested in getting it since I'm not a Sega or a Sonic fan, but even if I were, I wouldn't get it either due to how small it is. Sorry, but I'm giving it a skip. All right, well, lucky you that it's only in Japan. <laughs> All right, um, I'll go and read one more comment. Uh, okay, this is just, uh, <laughs> well, what, wouldn't it cause a bit of health issues, especially since the screen is so tiny? Uh, I once had a headache when I was playing on Nintendo 3DS, but with bigger consoles like PS3 and PS4, I play them for hours uh, with no health issues, and you can see a variety of details on those screens. But I will admit, I did own something similar as a kid. Uh, McDonald's once had Sonic handheld LD LCD games uh, for from a Happy Meal. They were addictive, but also headache-inducing. Oh my god, do you remember those things? think so oh yeah i remember I think so. yeah i remember when they when they used to sell those and oh my god i think it's really the noise that got to me that uh kind of put me off on those games like they are very simple but still like the game the 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 sounds that they make it's oh my god it's nothing but screeching yeah. it's nothing but yeah. screeching yes and design was in a different place back then for sure oh yeah but with that said, that should be it for today's episode. And Tariq, let me just say thank you so much for joining on this episode. Sorry for the uh, the little complications at the beginning, but it was definitely fun chatting with you on this. It was definitely great. It was cool, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and uh, before we go, before we go, actually, um, if people would be interested in knowing uh, where they could find you, if they want to see more of your stuff, uh, where can they find you on the internet? Um, on YouTube, I'm Tumorific Tariq T O O N R I F I C T A R I Q, and on Twitter, my initials T S H seven eight, and that's pretty much all I use right now. I used to be on Instagram a lot where I used to post my art, but I kind of like slowed up on that to focus on videos and stuff. So, yeah. All right. That's fair enough. So with all that said, I would like to say to everyone, thank you all so much for listening and thank you all so much for watching and tune in next time where we will have more fun filled episodes of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. So with all that said, until next time, see you later, dudes. You could say bye too, by the way. <laughs> I, I know that shit. I know that shit. Outro. I didn't want to step on any toes. So. <laughs> no, don't don't worry about it. Don't don't worry. Hey, it makes honestly. I I, I like this ending better. <laughs>